uh, that will actually be Dr. Josh Ling. Uh, and he'll be talking about chemohormonal therapy and treatment intensification. Thank you. Excellent. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present on what is, I think, a vital topic in the care of men with metastatic prostate cancer. So the overview for today's discussion will be reviewing the benefits of chemohormonal therapy in metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer. We'll talk about the stratification in the history of why we think about high versus low volume disease. And we'll also discuss the role of combination or triplet therapies in this setting as well. We'll also briefly discuss the roles of radiation and uh, of treatment of the primary tumor in low volume disease. And again, how we consider moving forward and integrating this into our treatment regimens. Now, when we step back and think about advanced prostate cancer, unfortunately, what we've seen is that there's been a significant increase in the number of patients who present with locally advanced and metastatic disease over the last decade compared to the decades prior. It's because of that exact situation where we really need to be identifying opportunities to better understand and treat these patients' disease. So I'll introduce you to one patient here. This is a 62-year-old gentleman uh, who presented initially with complaints of back and leg pain. He had an elevated PSA of 85, and a leg x-ray showed lytic lesions. That prompted staging bone and CT scans showing uh, widespread nodal disease, and a prostate biopsy was performed that identified a Gleason 4 plus 5 and 8 out of 12 cores. Now, patients in this situation, um, unfortunately, if we're seeing patients, about 8 to 10% of all patients with newly diagnosed prostate cancer are in a similar situation where they have metastatic disease at first diagnosis. This compares to 3.1% of patients back in 2005. Now, we know that in this clinical context, the, the use of androgen deprivation therapy alone, uh, that patients progress to CRPC within about 12 months and have a median overall survival of only three years. A number of clinical trials were ongoing back in the mid-2010s, uh, evaluating the potential combination of docetaxel to improve both PFS and OS. Now, there were three specific trials, the Charted Trial, Stampede, and get 215 And uh, we're going to talk about Charted and Stampede today. Um, please note, as a side, get 215 showed that there was a significant PFS improvement, but their OS data did not reach statistical significance, and that does come back to trial design issues. Now, the charted clinical trial, which was revolutionary at the time when it was initially published and has been updated in 2017, showed that for men in this clinical context, just as our patient that we discussed today, had a median overall survival of 57.6 months for the combination of ADT and docetaxel versus 47.2 months for men treated with ADT alone. Importantly, for men who had high volume disease at presentation, um, and we'll talk about what that means, the median OS was 51.2 months versus 34.4 months for those with ADT alone. Low volume disease in this clinical trial, there was not an overall survival benefit. Well, how did they come up with this, common, this, uh, this approach to defining high versus low volume? So their stratification factor was for patients who had uh, visceral metastases, especially liver disease, or at least four bone lesions with at least one lesion outside the vertebral column or pelvis. Please note when we talk about oligometastatic disease later today that the definition is different. So again, thinking of those patients, not unlike ours today, who present with high volume disease who would benefit from combination therapy potentially. Now the STAMPEDE trial is itself a very interesting clinical trial design. And as a population-based study where patients, are, it's the largest ongoing randomized clinical trial. So men present and to, are treated on a continuous control arm. That control arm is updated as new advances in the field occur, but then they continually add new uh, therapeutic arms as well. So in this case, they did have this in this adaptive trial design, the addition of docetaxel to ADT, again, for patients with metastatic disease, and did show an improvement in overall survival by about 10 months, medium 81 versus 71 months. So now we have two large randomized clinical trials that show the addition of chemotherapy for men with high volume disease does improve clinical outcomes. In terms of the administration of docetaxel, I will say that giving docetaxel in the castration sensitive setting is much better tolerated than in the castration resistant setting. These men have not been exposed to years of androgen deprivation therapy, and they, again, they have fewer side effects. <clears throat> 
It's an IV infusion given uh, at 75 milligrams per meter squared once every three weeks. There is no concurrent prednisone. Dose reductions are permissible. We do that to manage different AEs. Um, it's given with concurrent ADT, um, with or without bicalutamide. And we do a PSA every three weeks. Now, in this context, we do a baseline CAT scan and bone scan to evaluate sites of disease. And we often perform a scan after completion of therapy, again, for restaging. Now, we know from the clinical trials that were mentioned that, again, is generally well tolerated, that grade three or four febrile neutropenia with infection is quite low, between two to 5%. Fatigue happens. Um, how much of that is from the chemotherapy versus the ADT? Again, both contributing to that uh, particular toxicity. But again, in terms of these severe grade three or four toxicities, it's actually extremely low and uh, giving one of the great advances in medical oncology over the last 15 years has been improvements in supportive care. So things like nausea and vomiting, which you still see on TV these days, is actually quite rare these days, especially with taxane chemotherapy. Now for our patient, he was actually started on morphine uh, for pain by his PCP. He started combination therapy. He had a complete resolution in pain within four weeks. His PSA nadir to 0 0.07 and his lymphadenopathy also completely resolved. And in his case, we actually did do scans because of concerns for his uh, extensive disease and actually had a CR. Now, what about other opportunities for treating patients who present with metastatic disease at first diagnosis? So in another clinical trial, the Latitude study was uh, performed that enrolled 1,200 patients and they were randomized. Again, these were metastatic castration sensitive uh, disease at first diagnosis and randomized to Lupron versus Lupron plus Abiraterone. And importantly, we found a 38% reduction in the risk of death compared to the placebo and delayed cancer progression by 18 months. You know, again, for this clinical context, this is an incredibly impressive improvement, both in PFS and OS. Though, as I like to tell my trainees, when we look at these Kaplan-Meier curves, always look, again, especially at the RPFS data, I mean, what were the first 20% of patients that came off? How well did they do? And unfortunately, that we see that even in the, um, in the experimental arm with the combination, that still about 20% of patients will progress within the first 12 to 16 months. So again, there is a high risk portion of patient, uh, high risk uh, patients here, and we'll better define that later today as we talk about other genetic mutations. In terms of side effects, again, very manageable. Hypertension, elevated liver enzymes. So these are things that, again, we, it's important to manage, monitor these closely especially for patients that we expect to have years of benefit. Another clinical trial known as ARCHES evaluated the role of enzalutamide, again, in a similar clinical context. So I'm gonna kind of hit a running theme here, that combination therapy for men who present with metastatic disease improves survival. In this case, enzalutamide was shown to, uh, in this clinical trial showed to significantly improve RPFS. Subsequent uh, uh, follow-up also showed improvement in overall survival as well. Now, again, no head-to-head -head comparisons between abiraterone, enzalutamide, and apalutamide or darolutamide in any of these clinical contexts. So I can't tell you that one AR inhibitor is better than another. It's often for my patients driven by financial toxicity, so what can they best afford, as well as some of those other comorbid conditions that Dr. Gerard mentioned. Now, importantly, when we look in the ARCHES trial and we look at the subset analysis, we can see that there is benefit to the combination therapy in both high and low volume disease. We contrast that with docetaxel, where it was not clear that the benefit, at least in the charted trial, extended to patients with low volume disease. I will point out, however, in the stampede trial, low volume patients did have an improvement in survival. So again, some heterogeneity in terms of the clinical cohorts. However, it, we do know that combination therapy is the standard of care for men who present with metastatic prostate cancer. Lastly, we'll talk about the Titan trials. So this is using apalutamide, again, same clinical context, improved radiographic progression-free survival, 68 versus 47%, and overall survival at 82 versus 73% at 12 months. Importantly, I also want to point out the PSA undetectable rates, because there's been a number of follow-up studies that have shown that for patients in this clinical context who reach an undetectable PSA, that their clinical outcome extends far greater than those that don't. And we're talking many years of benefit, three, four, five, and even longer than that. And the side effects also in the uh, apalutamide trial with Titan was also actually quite comparable to placebo. So to summarize, we have a number of therapies that are FDA approved for patients who present with metastatic disease, docetaxel, AR pathway inhibitors, that have all shown to improve survival. Which leads to questions of how do we choose between them? So uh, again, chemotherapy versus an AR pathway inhibitor. 
I'm going to be very brief in this discussion, um, and it be, relates to the PEACE-1 trials and uh, the studies with darolutamide for triplet therapies. I'll just briefly point out that when we look at clinical outcomes comparing docetaxel versus abiraterone stampede, in the STAMPEDE study, almost identical improvements in survival. Um, in terms of other cause mortality, I will point out that there was a higher frequency in the STAMPEDE trials of other cause mortality with abiraterone compared to docetaxel. Whether that's cardiac in nature, you know, those are, again, things that are really important to monitor. And again, if you're treating your patients with abiraterone, enzalutamide, or any of the others, be sure that either you or their primary care physician is watching these other medical comorbid conditions. Um, how do we choose? Again, here's a list of other things that are kind of fall in this list. Again, you're seeing financial toxicity is often one of the first we think about for our patients. Um, a few other things that Dr. Gerard mentioned, so I won't belabor those points. But I do, in our last few minutes, want to spend some time talking about triplet therapy. Now, uh, again, remembering that patients with metastatic disease are not curable. However, our goal is to turn them into patients who can be treated for many years of time. And we see from all of those trials that I just showed you that we can achieve that for the majority of patients who present with metastatic prostate cancer. However, there's still a number of patients who don't receive those same benefits. What, why, and how? And what's the best way to care for those patients? So some very important questions were raised. Of, well, what about we have two different therapies. Can we bring all of them together? Can we do triplet therapy for patients with metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer? Now, the Aerosins trial was one approach where they took patients who, at the time when the study was designed, ADT and docetaxel was still considered a standard of care therapy for these patients. And they were randomized to with or without darolutamide. Now, importantly, there is a significant criticism of this trial is that they did not have another, another control arm of ADT plus darolutamide alone. So it leaves us with this question of is it the, which doublet is a triplet potentially superior to? So in this case, the, trip, the doublet we're comparing to is only ADT and docetaxel. 86% of patients presented with metastatic disease at first diagnosis, so meaning that these are patients who have an intact primary tumor. We can see that in this trial, they showed that the risk of death was significantly lower, 32.5% in the darolutamide group than in the placebo group, with a hazard ratio of 0.68. RPFS, OS, other clinical endpoints, including undetectable PSA, also improved with triplet therapy compared to doublet therapy with docetaxel. I'll say in my personal experience that overall, the adverse events, the toxicity actually quite similar. You know, maybe a little more fatigue that improves as patients stop the chemotherapy, again, because it's a time-limited six cycles of docetaxel chemotherapy, assuming that we don't need to stop for other adverse events. Um, there was another clinical trial that was conducted um, nearly at the same time called the PEACE-1 trial. Now, the PEACE-1 trial was initially designed, and it, it actually was a more complex design, but the uh, groups that we'll be focusing on for this discussion were, again, asking for men receiving ADT and docetaxel for metastatic disease versus ADT, docetaxel, and abiraterone. And importantly, what they showed was that the median duration of benefit was four and a half years with the triplet compared to two years with the doublet of ADT and docetaxel. So we have two confirmatory studies showing that triplet therapy is superior to ADT and docetaxel. And when you look at the NCCN guidelines, this was just updated last year. We're going to be talking about it more in a couple of weeks. That ADT and docetaxel, if it's all you have available for doublet therapy, is acceptable. However, the triplet therapy is FDA approved and is superior to ADT and docetaxel, again, if that's the direction you're pursuing. These trials did not answer the question of the combination or the comparison to ADT plus an AR pathway inhibitor. Now, just to show you the survival curves, because again, we, this is really vital when we think about for these particular patients. 48.9 months versus not reached at the time of this reporting, the curves separate very early at nine months. And we do see that there are patients with aggressive features that do very poorly, again, with ADT alone, and we know that from historical data. And again, I'm going to point out that when we look at that 12 to, you know, what are those first 20% of patients that come off of study in this particular trial? We're going out to over two years before those first 20% come off. So again, just another way that I like to ask, you know, who are these very high-risk patients and who's most likely to benefit? So when you have those high-risk patients with your standard clinical features, but hopefully also with your molecular testing, high-risk genetic mutations, the HRD mutations we heard about before, P53, RB, P10 loss, Again, all high-risk genomic features that we hypothesize will benefit from triplet versus doublet therapies. Um, 
other things, again, when we look at time to castration resistance, in some ways, again, even more profound when we look at the split in these curves, again, compared to ADT and docetaxel, as well as time to pain progression. Um, in terms of, excuse me, so the toxicities, again, here's the toxicities again. The triplet therapy is not meaningfully more toxic than ADT and docetaxel. So again, not a surprise. These are all things that are manageable. We get our patients through them. And this is, again, just showing confirmatory data when we look at the combination with abiraterone and how best to manage these patients who present with metastatic disease. Um, in terms of some take-home messages, so I'm going to belabor this point because we also know from some real-world evidence and other data that's coming out, less than half of men in the United States re receive appropriate doublet therapy for metastatic prostate cancer, which is itself shocking that less than half of patients are getting appropriate combination therapy that's been shown to improve survival by more than a year. Now, the use of triplet therapy in this clinical context is, you know, we, the data is not mature in terms of what's happening, you know, when we look at the SEER databases. Well, it's going to take a couple more years before we find out the frequency with which triplet therapy is being adopted. But if we're not even using doublets appropriately, the likelihood of us using triplet therapy is that much lower. So again, just putting everything in context that combination therapy is the standard of care and what we would recommend for all of our patients. Um, genetic testing, again, we're gonna talk a little bit more of this uh, later in the day, but if you're thinking about doing germline testing, again, for a patient with metastatic disease, you should also be thinking about doing somatic tumor testing as well. Again, every patient with metastatic cancer that this is approved under all guidelines, the patients with metastatic disease should have appropriate somatic tumor testing as well. Will it change whether you recommend uh, triplet versus doublet? Again, if your du preferred double is an ADT plus an AR pathway inhibitor, those prospective trials have not been done. They're being designed now. So we won't have an answer, unfortunately, for a number of years. But we do know that those high-risk genetic mutations are prognostic for poor clinical outcomes and can factor into our clinical decision making. Um, with that, I think we're going to go ahead and move on into our case-based